Since the theme tonight is film, I will mention right off that film is a hot medium as compared to TV. Uh, and uh, therefore, it has uh, much less power to involve the whole man than, than TV, or involve in the sense of drag people into its uh, parlor, as it were. But James Joyce devotes parts of the Finnegan's Wake to film and TV, and uh, he explains his approach to film is in the section called the Ont and the Grace Hopper. The Ont is a motor car, and the Grace Hopper is an airplane. And the Ont is the film, and the Grace Hopper is TV. Now, I'll, I'll just mention why he, they happen to pop up in that illustrative role. Joyce, I think, quite correctly saw that the motor car is very much like a movie camera, with the driver really in charge of screen and a camera alike, and having a moving picture uh, on his own. The, the driver of a motor car is by way of being a movie unit. Now, this isn't true of airplane. But the uh, motor car extends the feet of man. The driver of a motor car is a kind of paraplegic, very much like uh, someone seated in a movie theater looking at the great screen, the great environment outdoors. And uh, the movie is an extension of the human eyes, uh, the eyes extended pr prodigiously by means of the feet. Actually, in biologically or physiologically, the um, eyes are on a platform provided by the feet. The feet, I mean, the physiologists put it somewhat, somewhat in those terms, that man's eyes are provided with a mobile moving platform of feet. And um, the uh, fish are in a somewhat different position with regard to the use of the eye. But the movie as an extension of feet and eye is very different from TV, which is really an extension of the whole body. And the TV camera is much more an extension of the hand than it is of the feet or the eyes. The TV scanning finger uh, actively moves through and over objects. And uh, the TV uh, camera has really very few characteristics in common with the movie camera. It has no shutter. It doesn't take pictures. And uh, it handles its, the human environment. Moreover, the TV viewer is the screen, not the camera. The movie viewer is camera, his eyes go out at the world. The movie viewer looks at the world, which is enormously extended, enlarged, and made available to him. The TV cam uh, view viewer does not look at the world, it looks at him. He is the screen. The TV view the, uh, I'm, I'm saying, of course, that between the movie and the TV form, there is a profound antithesis a profound opposition. And whereas the, t the TV viewer is the screen with the image coming at him in Joyce's phrase, which he uses throughout the whole of Innigan's Wake, the TV viewer receives the charge of the light brigade. He is the valley of death, as it were. <laughs> and um, the TV tube is a charge of light particles that literally and physically move at the audience and cover you. Those little dots on the screen move onto you. Those little uh, particles of light invest the viewer and wrap around him. The TV viewer, uh, TV viewer is wrapped up in the space of the TV image which goes around him. And the in becoming the environment, instead of being detached as the movie viewer is and looking at an environment, in becoming an environment, the TV viewer, and this is true of all our youngsters since TV, feels profoundly part of the world. This amazing sophistication and sense of belonging to the world and feeling at home in all parts of the world, which is characteristic of those children for whom TV was a, an early experience, 
who had TV long before they learned to read and write. In my own family, there's a profound difference between the children who learned to read and write before TV and those who learned to read and write after TV. They have completely different habits of mind and, and social association. The uh, children who learn to read and write after TV are in a much more profound group, much more serious, grim if you like. The TV gener generation of youngsters is grim. They're not lighthearted, they're not playful, they're not detached. They have none of the fantasy of the old movie world or the old book world about them. They're deeply involved. They take everything very seriously. <clears throat> and, um, well, a lot, including a lot of things that would be better to be handled more playfully. I'm not trying to make value judgments here. I'm not trying to say that uh, the TV is good or bad or that movie is good or bad. I'm just trying to make a distinction between their mode of operation. And Joyce has this fascinating section. It's uh, in the Thunder Number no. 9 of Finnegan's Wake that he deals with the Ont and the Grace Hopper. Then in Thunder Number no. 10 on page 424, he goes straight over to TV and deals with the TV world as such. It's the last thunder in the book. The thunders, by the way, in Finnegan's Wake are moments of huge technological innovation and impact on society. The thunder is the rumble of social change response to new technology in the whole human society. The uh, thunder is simply the uh, a kind of world applause or response uh, to novelty and innovation. And there are 10 of these thunders, each one of which is very carefully worked out in terms of things like motor cars and telegraphs and television and movies. Now, the TV as plane is much more, you see, the, uh, the, an airplane is not the extension of the feet or the hands, it's an extension of the entire body, simultaneously. And that's why it brings it very much closer to TV than, uh, than it does to movie. The, um, all technologies, whatever, are extensions of our own physiology and our own sensory life. Naturally, when you extend these forms into the environment and make environments out of them, it has a profound effect on the rest of, the rest of our makeup. Now, the artists of the 19, later 19th century gave us a sort of preview of this coming change, whereas the photograph tended to scare artists away from realistic presentation representation of the world. The coming of electric technology was felt in the artist's radar system, as it were, and a man like Sura or Ruo responded by creating a new uh, visual form in painting that is called pointillism, or as, as in the case of Ruo, painting on stained glass uh, with the light coming through the object rather than light on object. And both of these painters were very much aware that if you want to create a huge involvement on the part of the audience, you must do that. You must have rear light, rear projection. You must have the light coming through the object at the viewer rather than having the light falling on the object and the viewer looking at the object. In Surah, in Pointillism, in which is a, a, a form of TV. Uh, Surah was painting TV long before there was any TV in, in, in uh, prospect. That is, in 1880, he was painting TV. He was painting this rear projection, all these little dots. He was, he was explicitly and consciously seeking to involve his reader in depth in the making process. The, the object of the artist in the later 19th century was to involve the viewer or the uh, audience in the making process. Edgar Allan Poe hit upon this with his detective story technique. He discovered that if you leave out all the connections in a story, the reader becomes profoundly involved in making them and in completing the story. The technique of the symbolist poem and the detective story of leaving things out creates huge involvement. TV leaves out most information. It's a very cool medium with very little uh, data provided in the image. The uh, engineers say, the information engineers say, 
In a photograph, there's very little information but much data, meaning by information they mean form. They say, on the other hand, in TV, there is much information and very few data. That is, in the TV image, there's not very many, there are not very many data, but there's lots of structure, lots of outline, lots of pattern. It's a cartoon form. It's iconic. Just a crude, rough image compared to the photograph. Now, when an image is rough and crude, like a storyboard in an advertising agency, there is profound involvement. When, when you polish it up, fill it in, complete it, then the viewer has no possibility of involvement. He's just left outside looking at a completed image. So paradoxically, TV creates much involvement because it provides so little in the way of data. The movie creates much less involvement because it's a much better image, provides far more data, leaves the viewer outside enjoying the image in a relative detachment. <coughs> there are many popular misconceptions about this, uh, but I'm not, uh, I'm not, I won't try to deal with them now. Uh, we'll perhaps have a question period or a question and answer period at the end. There's a, an old story you've probably heard before about two goats that were chomping on an old uh, batch of films that had been thrown out behind an MGM studio in Hollywood. And one of the goats uh, kicked open a, an old tin that held a picture of Gone with the Wind and sort of signaled to his neighbor to come on, try some of this. When his pal came along and nibbled a bit of Gone with the Wind, the first one said, how do you like that? After a little meditation, the other one said, oh, well, I think I like the book better. <laughs> and the, it's, it's not, that's not intended as a profound insight into the, <clears throat> into the media, but it's somewhat like the sort of insights one often hears. The, uh, speaking of the charge of the Light Brigade as, as a TV form, um, involving us in ourselves. One of the strange effects of TV, of course, is to drive us inward. Uh, the TV generation is a depth-oriented generation, and if there's any value in depth and profundity, we're going to get it from the TV generation as never before. Um, I think uh, there's something to be said to, for uh, the world of Mae West and Harold Lloyd as well. Uh, a little playfulness, a little coon uh, 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 what do they call it? Coon skinism, in the way of uh, frivolity, playfulness, and so on, has its advantages over profundity at times. But the Aqualung people, you see, are unwitting victims of TV, and all the underwater divers are trying to simulate TV environments, which they can have much less expense at home in front of the TV set. The TV viewer is a sort of underwater diver. He lives in an, an element of total submersion and total involvement that is of low definition, very low uh, visual quality. I have heard skin divers arguing bitterly about the desecration of the underwater landscape by irresponsible skin divers who not like the old complaints about uh, tourists who left tin cans and things around in public places. You know, the the, there's now developing a league to protect underwater landscapes from the desecration of travelers and tourists. And uh, so it's uh, the, quite, a, quite a, a novel form of complaint. There's another story I've heard recently that helps with some aspects of <coughs> media. It concerns uh, Mel Rowe, the uh, Minister of Culture for uh, de Gaulle, taking de Gaulle on a tour of a, an art gallery. And as they move through various paintings, de Gaulle would say, and what's that one? Ah, says Monroe, that is a Dufy. Mm -hmm. And that one, ah, that is a Renoir. Then de Gaulle brightened up. As they moved on a little further, he said, uh-huh, I see uh, that monstrous looking cartoon effect over there. That must be a Rouault. No, sir, said Monroe, that is a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is not to this is to reveal the strange results of light through as a, compared to light on. Uh, 
it uh, is not intended as derogatory to anybody whatever. <laughs> one, of, one of the amazing dimensions of film, as it was reflected in the novel, was stream of consciousness. Cinema, or moving images, when translated into prose, can produce this quite a wonderful effect, stream of consciousness. And the stream of consciousness writers discovered to their surprise that the reader could get far more em empathy, involvement in the mental processes of characters by disconnected, broken shots than they could by simple storyline interpretation. This uh, is still a mystery, that is the uh, relation of stream of consciousness to the developing movie technologies is also uh, an area that uh, is richly illustrated in symbolist poetry and I find it useful sometimes in teaching Mr. Elliot's poetry to point out how the proof rock world is very much a Charlie Chaplin sort of comedy and uh, with the shots, the shots are very much in the style of early silence and uh, with a sort of jazz effects. Mr. Elliot is from St. Louis and uh, brought the blues to Britain, <laughs> to British poetry. There again, a very curious thing, speaking of light and shade and sound. The blues, as a form of involving, are uh, famous. And if you have a, a bright, smart, cheerful, or any kind of melody completely tied in, it is a much less effective means of involving people than syncopation with its breaks and discontinuities which compel people to fill them in. The um, strange, uh, I suppose the word blues, uh, permits this direct encounter of forms, uh, like uh, syncopation itself, Instead of a nice, smooth, melodic line, you have these abrupt interruptions which permit far more involvement. The, um, the world of uh, Mozart is a very pictorial world in musical terms. That is, there's much light and shade in it and much foreground and background and perspective. Many of the spaces in Mozartian music are arranged just exactly like a Fragonard painting or a Boucher painting. You can have spaces, visual spaces, introduced into music. Auditory space is a very uh, fascinating type of space, quite different from visual space. And this ties in with this matter of storyline. Visual space is con continuous and connected. Anything that causes visual space to be upgraded in a culture will cause also respect for unity and continuity and connectedness. Anything that, this is true only of the visual sense, the um, other senses don't have this built-in characteristic of unity, uh, connectedness, uniformity, and so on. There is no uniformity or connectedness in hearing or in uh, touch, as Alec Layton put it, to the blind all things are sudden. Blind people don't have a sense of uniform, continuous space. They live in a world of abrupt discontinuities and uh, insights. The ancient world had the blind man always as the very type of the seer, the sage, the insight man. Uh, because his, uh, being deprived of the merely visual sense, he was in a position to pr plunge depth insights into situations. Well, the world of the stream of consciousness is very much in debt in the novel and in poetry to the movie form. And one thing that I would like to add to Tony's observations about the tape recorder, it has made us very conscious of sounds in our environment of which we are ordinarily unconscious. John Cage has a definition of silence in which he says, Silence consists of all those sounds that are unintended. All the unintended sounds in the environment constitute silence. And 
It is the unintended sounds in the environment that the tape recorder and such instruments can now put right into the concert hall. This is why this happened with the photograph when it was new. The photograph brought images into the popular press, magazines, that ordin the, uh, images of things in the human environment of pe which people were completely unaware. The one thing that people do not see is their environment. They see the previous environment, not the actual one. Uh, this, uh, anyway, with the photograph, people began to notice the actual state of their cities, their yards, their homes, their houses, their clothing, the way they looked for the first time, say a century ago. And just as the tape recorder is brought into our environment, the sounds that are unintended brought into the concert hall. So the photograph brought into the world of direct attention and inspection a whole world of images that people ordinarily ignored. Now, one of the effects of the tape recorder, you can see, is to compel people to regard the sound environment as a work of art. Many electric tendencies in our environments today encourage people to begin to think about the possible programming of the human environment as if it were a work of art. Instead of worrying about what you put inside art galleries, taking a direct approach to the environment itself as a work of art. The Balinese have a saying, we have no art, we do everything as well as possible. They're quite aware of the fact that the Westerner regards art as a sometime thing that can be put into a special little space while the rest of the, the, rest of the environment can be just anything. However, to get back onto the, um, the movie has notice, noticeably become much more of an art form in popular and even uh, erudite estimation since TV. Since TV, movie of course is the movie is the old environment. TV goes around it as new environment. Movie goes up as art form. Yes, uh, it's uh, it's really very noticeable that since TV, movie has become art form. Old silence, old movies of any sort are now cherished and regarded with new awe and reverence. And this happened. This has happened over and over again in the human past. Every time a new form goes around an old form, the old form becomes an art form. It's like old uh, coach lamps, old buggies, old Model Ts, old anything. They all become art forms. It's like Williamsburg. The Williamsburg treatment of old environments as if they were works of art. Um, now that the planet has a new environment, a man-made environment of satellites and electric information, you can depend upon it that the planet is itself going to become an art form. <laughs> that old nose cone, that old spacecraft, our planet, our human habitat, is going to be tidied up with vast expenditure of thought and energy as the place where it all began. <laughs> the old habitat to which one can return occasionally on a pilgrimage. Oh, there's strong evidence of this uh, as occurring already. One of the observations that comes to mind that has been made about sound, when sound came to film, photograph, when the, when the, the photograph suddenly had a soundtrack put on it around it, when radio was put around film, the effect of the effect of sound on images was extraordinary and it, as you remember perhaps, was very disrupting. It caused uh, much heartburn and heartache and uh, much tossing out of old stars, John Gilbert's and so on, because the radio image is a hot image the photograph is a hot image, and when those two hot images get together, they do things to each other. They compel the movie camera to become a much more hi-fi, much more precise. One of the reasons for the charm of the old silence is that they're so lo-fi. They're very much like TV, which is real lo-fi. The silence 
are closer to TV, well, so is Batman, so are the comics, than they are to movies. And one of the observations that has been made about the coming of sound to movies was that instead of just presenting a sequence or story in a series of pictures, the tendency of sound was to cause the camera to dwell on each shot in depth and to include the whole story, as it were, in each shot. The shot became inclusive rather than exclusive. And this compelled all sorts of subtle mastery of form that was a considerable strain on the industry. It, um, well, I think you might say that it knocked some countries right out of the movie business, partly because of the vast new expense of sound and uh, the new virtuosity needed for photography. Uh, some of the leading countries in film production were knocked right out of the business. Uh, they didn't have the resources. The, um, however, that's merely uh, incidental. The, um, since TV, however, there has been much weakening of the storyline in film. TV is not a narrative medium. It doesn't need narratives. The individual shot is very inclusive, just like a cartoon. A cartoon is not a picture, and it has no point of view. It includes all possible point of view, points of view in each cartoon. Dagwood or uh, Little Abner or anybody, each, of the, each cartoon is complete. It's total. It's the whole image of that person in all his possible modalities. This isn't true of photography. Uh, photography is highly specialist. It selects an aspect, a moment in the life of the thing. The cartoon does not select a moment in the life of the thing, and the photograph does. The movie does. And this high selectivity in time, just the isolated moment, creates a very strange world. Storyline is very helpful and needful in film when it uses hi-fi photography. But in lo-fi, as in a chaplain, the need for intense uh, connectedness is much smaller. In TV, the need for connectedness is much less than in movie, for the same reason, and the uh, viewer can fill in at liberty many of the connecting missing bits. In the case of the influence of TV on movies, it might, I, I expect it might be illustrated by the sudden growth of the uh, interest in, and the vogue for Dr. Zhivago's, Fellini's, Bergman's, in which storyline is rather incidental and insignificant compared to the mood, the mode, the modulation and variation of single situations and images. This variation of theme, of mode, is taking the place of storyline since TV. And I think you'll find that our children uh, the TV generation are not nearly so interested in narrative or storyline, whether in library form or in film form, as um, their older brothers and sisters. The um, loss of interest in narrative and the sudden upgrading of facts, you know, the romance shows, the thing novel, the research novel, the sudden interest in just raw data in cold blood, in place of story, and again, going with this, no interest in point of view. The angle is not important. The reviewers of Capote's In Cold Blood were puzzled in some cases, and some observed that the murderer probably was the author, or <laughs> alternatively, the reader. It couldn't, have been, it couldn't have been those people in Kansas. Now, this again, a very confusing behavior on the part of our young 
this indifference to ordinary responsibility and ordinary cause and effect in the older connected sense, storyline sense, this sense of involvement is so great that they no longer are too concerned about who done it or why. And um, this kind of involvement is almost an oriental thing, I think, in the t case of the TV generation. It goes along with a considerable loss of the sense of identity or a considerable loss of him of any feeling of importance attaching to identity. As you know, the existentialists have long urged that what we call our personal or private identity is really just a kind of visa or classification, uh, arbitrary set of data which have a rather incidental relation to anybody. But this mood, I'm not trying to argue a case here, I'm simply pointing to this change of mood and this Loss of sense of identity is uh, uh, perhaps in its most extreme form manifested in the LSD and the drug sort of crazies, where people deliberately scrub off the tape of personal awareness. I want to, uh, having uh, just uh, made that kind of tour, I want to point out one of the strange things about the movie when it was new, the beginning of the century. It seemed hilarious, it seemed comic simply because it was so perfect a repeat of ordinary experience, ordinary living. It became, uh, the movie in its early phase was a parody of life, an imitation of life in a comic sense because it just went along parahados against or along beside the track of real life. The picture track, the movie picture track, and the track of real life were almost interchangeable and this creates a very comic effect. Realism, when new, is comic. Hilarious. Go back to the days of Sam Peeps and, uh, and uh, Daniel Defoe and you'll see what I mean. With the coming of realism, prose realism, uh, it was a new mythic form that created a very comic and satiric world. This was the great age of satire. Realistic forms uh, created a comic and satiric effect in the case of Pepys, Diary, and in the case of Defoe, Robinson Crusoe sort of thing. One of the reviewers of Robinson Crusoe said, Mr. Defoe has represented the British Isles as totally depopulated. This I found a very valuable and comical sidelight on the effect of realism on people for whom realism was new. The um, Valerie, the uh, symbolist poet, said of the movie, it is the complete, perfect, mechanical form of memory, it re visual memory. This is a, a fascinating and startling insight to think of the movie as a form of mem memory storage. Now anybody can see the book in that form. There's a certain sense in which the book is a, sto a storage system. Uh, the movie as a storage system, a visual storage system, a visual memory, points straight toward the computer as a storage system which takes on all the senses. The movie though as a visual, complete visual memory terrified people in, the, in 1900 because it seemed to rob them of all their natural mental functions. The world of circuitry, of electric circuits, takes people profoundly inside themselves, is a kind of entropic world. It folds us in. It creates a thing like the safety car. The safety car is the car turning in upon itself entropically, and entropy, you know, is the law of declining energies. The uh, entropy turning inward upon itself, the, car, the, the, uh, the safety car becomes a padded cell for maniacs to drive it. And most people, you know, are inclined to say when they hear about the safety car, but wouldn't anybody in a safety car go berserk? Wouldn't he just bump into everybody and everything? Isn't that a strange reaction? It's like the old, you remember the old bump cars at the, uh, at the circuses? 
They, they, some people tend to regard the safety car as a bump car in which you can really behave as if you're in a Sherman tank and you can just go rip, <laughs> rip roaring around, knocking everybody helter skelter. Um, but the um, the tendency then of the movie to become um, a kind of iconic form at first and then gradually a high fi high definition form uh, le leads me to just say a word or two about the rise of the visual because the movie represented our Western world going into very top gear visual life and now with TV we've slipped into very low gear visual life with a resulting change of psychosomatic adjustment and uh, change of mood. But I just want to say a couple of things, uh, especially with an audience like this interested both in the book and film and other forms. I just wanted to draw your attention to this aspect, that the work of people uh, like Innocent Havelock, Havelock's preface to Plato sort of volume, and the work of Barfield in a book called Saving the Appearances have drawn attention to the fact that with the rise of uh, phonetic literacy, with the coming of phonetic literacy, people got a detachment from the world that the old native societies never were able to achieve. Phonetic literacy, by pushing up visual life into high intensity, gave people a form of detachment that was absolutely new in human history. It created the civilized man, the, the detribalized individual. And subsequent improve, improvements in writing and printing and bookmaking intensified that detachment. I'm talking about the medium as the message or the massage. You, if you live in an intensely visual world, you learn the habits of civilized detachment. If you live in an intensely auditory and tactile world, you learn the habits of empathy and involvement. But uh, Havelock describes in a most impressive way the stages by which the Greeks moved out of the world of Homer, the auditory poetic world, into the world of Plato and the visual classification of ideas and data. This is now presumably a tape that is being played backwards. We are now rapidly, thanks to electronic technology, moving from the world of Plato back to the world of Homer. From the world of intense visual classification back to the world of intense auditory involvement. We are easily confused on these issues uh, because they are very complicated issues. For example, it's easy to say and perhaps true to say. An artist never works because he uses all his faculties all the time, and that's play. When a person is using all of his faculties, all his senses, he's playing, he's creating. When you're making out your income tax or adding up figures, you're using only a small part of your faculties, that's work. In other words, the fragmented man works, the integral man plays. A child is creative until he learns to read and write. Children are all geniuses until the age of five or six because they're using all their faculties simultaneously. Then they learn to specialize and separate their faculties and, and become civilized. It's not simple, is it? It's not uh, all one thing or another thing. I think perhaps possibly there may be means eventually of an orchestration of these faculties, an orchestration of media, so that they will not uh, batter each other to bits and batter us to bits. To come back to storyline for a moment, Aristotle's famous remark in the Poetics about plots, and his remark, for example, that of all plots, the episodic are the worst, was referring to a very strange discovery in the Greek day Namely that if you began to take happenings, events, and tie them together in a line or a sequence, you could get a plot. Now, in actual fact, events never are tied together. 
They all happen simultaneously in real life, and most events are coincidental and overlay each other, and therefore they have no plot-like character whatever. To an Aristotle in his time, when, when visual life and visual order was new, the uh, tying of things together in a sequence was a dazzling discovery of visual order. And so with the dropping down of visual level, uh, the need for plot and the desire for plot also drops down. And you'll find very little of it in Fellini or Bergman or the Zhivago type of film. But to stay for a moment with the visual world as it came to us and eventually reached the high level of movie. With the coming of Gutenberg technology, uh, the handwritten manuscript went up into very hi-fi form. The old uh, manuscript was called, uh, for example, textura, meaning tapestry. Uh, to a medieval eye, there was very little difference between a tapestry and a handwritten page. So they called it textura. And um, with, when it went up into hi-fi visuality with Gutenberg repeatable type, it lost all that textura. The page lost the involvement of the reader. The reader became a detached spectator of the page. Silent reading became possible for the first time in the world. You can't have silent reading until you have printing, just as you can't have grammatical errors until you have writing. This is literally true. A child never makes a mistake in slang. No child ever made a, a, a grammatical mistake in the use of slang because, on the other hand, if he had to write it down or if teacher had to write it down, they'd both make mistakes in slang at once. Translating from the auditory to the visual form is very tricky. Very few people can accomplish it without slips. The bad speller, for example, is often a poet, a genius. People who of high auditory uh, orientation are very poor spellers. Uh, uh, the IQ testers uh, pay no attention to this fact. However, the, um, this business of Gutenberg visuality, stepping up things up to high intensity, made it possible for the first time in human history for the whole of society to become a rearview mirror with a historical perspective backwards. In the 16th century, what we call modern history was born, and the rearview mirror of life became a major fact. Everybody began to look backward, whether it was at the primitive church or at the wrongs done to his private family. Hamlet is a nice example of the rearview mirror. Here is a man totally alienated from the present world, look on this picture and on that, who was absolutely obsessed with the past events in his life. Oh, what a noble mind is here or throw. He's a man in a mirror, looking at the past, incapable of coping with the present. Much of the art of his time was likewise, whether it was the Greek mythology being illustrated by painters, or uh, the mirror for magistrates with moral tales of evil deeds done in the past by virtuous men. All rearview mirror. But the great example of it is Paradise Lost, in which the whole of the human condition is used as a rearview mirror to get a view of the Garden of Eden. This is a fantastic achievement. It tends to uh, dwindle away a bit from that point into what is called later, the little later, the Graveyard School of Poetry, where people wandered around gra graveyards in order to meditate upon the human past, on mute and glorious Miltons and Cromwell's guiltless of their country's blood. But using the graveyard as a rearview mirror became a great artistic pastime. It ended suddenly with the Newtonian discovery of the uh, world as a mental mirror, the whole world as a mirror of the mind of man. The Romantics dropped history and began simply to meditate on the mirror of the human mind that was lay in the external page of, na of nature. Now, this was uh, stepping up the visual intensity of civilization a great deal, and photograph and film came not too long afterwards, and in them, the 
rearview mirror became very strong, you may have noticed that the Victorian novels all begin back 30, 40 years before the publication date of the book. They all were rear, rear view mirrors. And nobody knows why. And no, uh, it, it wasn't even noticed at the time. But the novels of Scott and Dickens and everybody all start back 30 years before the publication date, just as a matter of course. The idea, again, of giving the world as it is right now came in much more with photo and with film. And with the rise of photographic realism, uh, the novelist, too, was affected, just as the painter was. The painter tended to turn more towards structural forms, and the novelist turned more towards structure and turned the novel more and more into poem. Flaubert created the first novel poems. A, a novel like uh, Madame Bovary is a poem in the sense that it is a simultaneous order. Everything that happens, happens at once and happens to everything else in the book. Well, to hurry on a bit, art under those conditions, art as structure rather than as realistic record, uh, became a probe. And uh, I think it is a very large revolution in human affairs when Art ceased to be a rearview mirror, ceased to be a mere way of recording, and became a means of probing, experimenting, trying to discover what the world is, what it's made of. Art and science joined hands with the coming of the uh, symbolist and structural novels of the Flaubert type. Art as a probe or as a means of teaching perception is familiar in the phrase of people like Conrad, it is above all that you may see. They write in order that people may perceive what otherwise they're not going to perceive. Flaubert said, if people had read my sentimental education, there would not have been a Franco-Prussian war. And I don't think that he's exaggerating, but it means not only reading it, but perceiving what he's up to. But the, um, this changeover from art as a sort of elitish rearview mirror game, old masters, into a probe, a scientific means of discovery, is a, 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 a revolution that still rocks a lot of bandwagons and boats, and uh, is a revolution that is felt still within the film industry as well as in the entertainment world in general. Whether or not art should be a means of discovery or should it just be a means of wrapping oneself around with the old environment in a sort of comfortable dream world? The art of the art of our time in its most intense moments tends toward the latter probe, heuristic probe technique, toward prediction rather than proof and retrospect. And film is in, increasingly involved in these forms. Paradoxically, pop art, uh, comic strips and so on, tend to be rather avant-garde in the sense that they are always probing new situations. I'm not talking about the uh, storyline in them, I'm talking about their artistic mode. Pop art, uh, popular forms of entertainment, whether in the Elizabethan period, are now, or in uh, Dickens and Poe and Al Cap, are now regarded as serious investigations into the environment of the time. Dickens was intensely aware of the new changes in his time as was uh, the uh, Edgar Allan Poe. And uh, these people only achieve artistic status when they get moved into some other culture in some other time. As soon as the Al Caps are old enough, they're precious art forms, as soon Edgar Allan Poe and Dickens are regarded as absolute drivel by the, most of their contemporaries, but by the, uh, Edgar Allan Poe was regarded as a sort of artistic saint by Baudelaire, by Valéry, move him out of his culture into another culture, move Dickens into Russia, and he's a great man, a great artist, and so on. This creates all sorts of confusion in many people's minds. Why should a thing be junk in one culture and great art in another? It has to do with the changing patterns of perception. And so, uh, with cowboy pictures and gangsters and Beatles, the uh, unmistakable 
triumph of artistic invention and unintended greatness has come very often to American films in things like the cowboy gangster pictures where people are free to play with their senses and get outside studios and outside movie lots and to uh, re exploit the resources of the total environment uh, under conditions of playfulness rather than a grim artistic earnestness. The, uh, the world of the Beatles in the same way is a, an area like Chaplin in which people put on the audience. The reason the Beatles are so powerful has nothing to do with their artistic merits in any abstract sense. It has to do with the fact that they have succeeded in putting on the audience, both in sound and in appearance. That is, the image they have created is one that has been drawn from the public. It doesn't come out of their insides at the public at all. Charlie Chaplin was an artist not because he had anything to say, but because he put on the audience. He selected certain modes of audience behavior and wore them as a mask, a, an artist mask. The great entertainer, the great artist, always has that infallible power of just reaching for this bit and that bit of the public gesture and rhythm, putting it on. <laughs>